Good morning. Welcome, welcome to Trinity Bible Church. We're so glad to have you here this morning. We look forward to this worship service and what the Lord is going to do in our lives today. We're going to start off this morning. If you would, please stand with us as Pastor leads us in our pledges, then we will start our service. Pastor? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God,
come forward at the time for our pastoral prayer. And uh, Pastor, thank you very much. Bert, glad to see you back. You were gone last week, and I was having to do this, and I know what I'm doing. <laughs> glad to come back. Glad to visit with us. Glad to have uh, Samuel. We've got some folks with him here today. Samuel, who, who do you have with you, Samuel? The whole crew. The whole crew. <laughs> All right. Which, introduce them. Do you know them by name? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's introduce them to us. Uh, my father, Stephen, my mother, Amy, my sister, Anna, my brother, Stephen. All right. Good to have all your friends and all the other issues. Not to mention this, that I would have some folks ask questions about membership, and I'll, I'll be meeting and talking with some folks about membership. And if you're not a member of the church and you feel led of the Lord to do so, there are four, four prerequisites. You know the Lord is your personal Savior. You have been uh, baptized. The Bible is the final authority, and this is where God will have you come and labor in his vineyard. So if you'd like to consider that, then let me know. We'll be glad to talk with you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of knowing you as our Savior. Thank you for the blessing of being a born-again Christian. We thank you, Lord, that you are our Father in heaven. We pray, Father, for... Uh, the folks in Israel, that you'll give comfort and encouragement to those folks there. And we thank the Lord for the way you use that nation to bring through those channels the Word of God. And we pray, God, for their well-being and for a spiritual awakening that many of the Jewish people, many more of the Jewish people, will become will come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I ask, Lord, that you'll be with our law enforcement as they strive to keep our streets safe, military, our nation safe. The storm, Lord, we ask that you just make it go away. Just go away. Amen. Protect us and watch over us. We pray for those who are ill, especially for Dennis. We ask for healing for his body. Others of our church family, such as Lynn, ask your blessing to fund them. Anoint us with your spirit, our Lord. May, the, may your spirit, may we join as the folks at there when that young man was resurrected. And say, yea, God has visited us here today. So, Lord, make your presence known and felt. May the Spirit of God speak to our hearts as we go through the Word of God today. Thanking you for loving us, and thank you for teaching <laughs> us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debts. Lead us not on temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and glory, forever. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. How many of you were here when Hurricane Hugo came through in the aftermath? Not very many. That's why Pastor prays that the storm goes away. I was here, and it was life altering. So, y'all be praying. I'm not, I'm not living in fear, and I'm not trying to instill fear, but that's a very real prayer. <laughs> so make it go away. So that's good. So y'all be praying for that. Let's uh, stand and sing, I shall know him, him 573. I shall know him, him 573. Please stand and sing. <laughs> Oh. 
Let's pray. Excuse me, Mr. Officer. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We gather in your house once again. We ask that you bless these uh, tithes and offerings uh, to your service and to give you the honor and the praise and the glory for everything that these tithes and offerings are used for in your name. In Jesus Christ's name I pray.
that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and have charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea, who is there among you of all his people, his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And, where, so, and, and whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, gold, goods, etc., etc. And notice it says, and be, beside the free will offering for the house of God, that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the father of Judah and Benjamin and the priest, the Levites, with all them whose spirit, with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Thank you, Lord, for your word. May the Spirit of God speak to us now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, Ezra, a very unique person. He was a priest when there was no temple. So what was he to do? Attempted to destroy it. So what is he to do? Sit around and do his fingernails? Well, he is the descendant of Helkiah, who was the high priest, who we back in Second Chronicles finds, that they discovered a book, the Bible of that day. And it brought about revival to the land as the word of God was read in the days of Josiah King, and there was a covenant made with the people that as they made a covenant to walk in the will of God. And revival came to that land that day. Now fast forward. Okay. And we find the children of Israel have been in captivity. And uh, we'll talk about that. But we find during this time, Ezra, in chapter 7, verse 6. I'll read this to you if you'd like to take a minute to find it. And chapter 7, verse number 6. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready, a ready scribe in the law of Moses. Scribes were those who made copies of the Bible, and they knew every jot and every tittle. And it says here that this man was ready. He knew the Word of God. He read the Scriptures. He understood the Scriptures. And because of him, and because of his compassion for the Word of God, revival came to the land. Revival. He organized the synagogue and got that back on track. He, ordered, he, he set up the order of the scribes and got that back on track. It was Dwight Alhuda who said, for revival to come to your land, for revival to come to America, it must come through people, God's people in this book. And that's why we here at our church do the pledges once a month, the first Sunday of each month, and we make a pledge to the flag of the United States of America, to the Christian flag, and to the Word of God. The Word of God is the final authority at Trinity Bible Church. Amen. We do not go with the trends of the time. We do not, we do not sway with the, what, social, what, what, what is being socially embraced by the society, but we stand true by the grace of God and the Word of God, holding fast to the Word of God. Now... Well, uh, the theme of this book is the Word of God. Numerous times you'll find in the book of Ezra these words, the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. Now you'll notice here in chapter 9, it's Ezra chapter 9, verse number 4, Ezra 9, verse number 4, there were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the Lord God of Israel. Hear that? Move on over to chapter 10, verse number 3. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the, um, etc., etc., according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandments. Tremble at the word of God, at the commandments of God. Now there were two prophets that we'll talk about briefly. One of them named Elisha, the other one named Elijah. Elijah was the older. 
And, and Elijah, his name actually meant, my God is Jehovah. And we find him calling down fire at Mount Carmel. We find him being carried up, carried up and he carried a, 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 a flower and chariot. And we find his mantle falling in the hands of Elisha. And Elisha asked Elijah to give him a double portion, meaning can I perform twice as much for the Lord as you did? And we find he performed quite a few miracles, but he was lacking one miracle. He was supposed to perform one more, and he died. Hmm. But years later, as they were burying a man, some folks that were somewhat of a threat to the people who were burying him quickly put him in Elijah, in Elisha's uh, burial place, and when this dead man touched the bones of Elisha, he rose up and was alive. The last miracle. Well, we're talking about rising up, okay? We're talking about God is the one who brings things up. God is the one who brings about re resurrection. He is the one who resurrected our Lord and Savior. He is the one who resurrected the young man at, at the town of Nim. He is the one who, uh, it is the power of God who does this. So at the title of our sermon we talked about is God raises. First of all, God raises his word. Okay? He sent some spies out as they were seeking the promised land, and they meandered around for 40 days, spying out the land. And they came back, and all but two of them said, No, the end is too great. We can't do this. Don't go in there. They're giants. We like grasshoppers to them. And so God said, Okay, we'll have it your way. You meandered around for 40 days as spying out the land. So you will meander around for 40 years in the wilderness. And that's why that happened. Now we find them hauled off to Babylon. Why was they, why were they hauled off to Babylon? Well, every seventh year they would have this uh, Sabbath year where no planting was done and no harvesting was done. And they were to spend all their time with their family teaching and memorizing scripture and bonding together as believers. That's what they were supposed to do. But for 490 years, they said, we're tired of that stuff. It's not necessary we go to church and go to Sunday school and learn things in the Bible. I'm using it for this. And so they, for 490 years, refused the Sabbath year, and so they planted their crops, and they harvested their crops, and they planted their crops for 490 years, and God said, okay, Every seventh, multiply that, 70. For 70 years, the land will be idle and no one will do any harvesting. How will that be? I will have you haul off to Babylon. So they were hauled off to Babylon for 70 years. God's word stands true no matter what society may think or do. God's word stands true. With all this going to, on today and all the ungodliness and, and the most ungodly thing that I saw news about the introduction of the Olympics which by the way is a picture of tomorrow that's where our culture is going okay that's right. let you know all of those who adhere to the word of God will stand true and not be bent by the swaying of the time now we find another time God proves himself is in the days of Jeho Jehoiakim in his day um, Jeremiah sends him a copy of scripture that God told him to write. And to him, Jehoiakim was having a relaxing winter in his nice cabin and fireplace. And when they read to him what God was going to do, and he was rebelling against God. Let me just stop a minute. Rebellion is the most dangerous thing you can do. I discovered that April 1961, one midnight, waist deep in the Atlantic Ocean at Folly Beach. I was rebelling against God. And that's a story of itself. And if you want to hear the rest of that story, I'll charge you for it. Okay? <laughs> but rebellion is very dangerous. So he's rebelling. And so he takes the Bible, in essence, and he takes his pen knife, and he cuts it all up, and throws it in the fire. God says, you know what? You're going to die, and nobody's going to celebrate your death. And sure enough, he died, and they chunked his body across the wall, and it decayed in the sun. 
You see, God's word is true. And he's always fulfilling his promises. He's always upholding what he teaches. And the one thing we need to do at Trinity Bible Church, and that's why, when you wrote by that sign, what do you see? Trinity Bible Church. God founded this church. We'll talk about that a little later. I didn't, I'm not the founder of it. God is the founder of it. And so we find that God has a way of lifting up his word. We'll talk about that a little bit a little later. Secondly, we find that God raised up three kings. When I was at Hardwell Pastor Church there, we were having a Christmas play. And we had these three guys, and one was named Lang Scott. James Edward, and the other guy was thinking of a spider monkey. So right now I can't remember his name, but we'll stick with spider monkey. But, but yeah. And so during the Christmas play, these three young men would come in singing, we three came. By the way, did you know I taught him how to sing? <laughs> yeah, I knew him way back in little. He listened to care he listened carefully to my singing and learned to do the exact opposite of what happened. <laughs> but they came in singing, we three. And so fast forward, Lang Scott goes off to Nashville, becomes real popular in the country music, his daughter makes a big hit. So he's now Nashville star, singing at Grand Ole Opry. And I'm back up there. Do y'all know what Yellow Jacket Road is? No. You know it. Way off down the Transman Park. I'd been out hunting and I was coming back in. And uh, my phone rings, and there's a singing. We three men. And so then I lose contact because I'm way out in the middle of nowhere. And it breaks up. Well, just prior to that, my nephew had called me. And I had texted me to show me a picture of a duck in bag that morning. And so I'm thinking that was my nephew that had called me. So then, as I'm coming along, connection a little bit better, on comes this voice singing, We Three Men. And I said, You sound like an 18 wheeler hit you. And the driver stopped to find out what he did. And he backed up to see just what he ran over. And all of a sudden, I hear his voice, Brother Bear, preach. He always called me a preacher bear. Preach Bear, preach. This is Lang Scott. I had just insulted a country singer, and uh, I've never lived it down, but nonetheless, we have three kings. So here in the Old Testament are three kings. The first king is Cyrus. Isaiah 45 verse 1 says, 200 years before he was born, God told Isaiah, a man named Cyrus will come and deliver Israel from the bondage it under, and restore them back to Jerusalem. <coughs> Isaiah 45 says, I have raised him up in righteousness. Now what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He gathered all the Jewish people and he hauled them like cattle and some of them they killed. If a mama had a baby it was screaming and the baby was getting in the way they bashed the beaver's head across a rock and on and on they went. Those were things that Nebuchadnezzar did. And he hauled all the gold and silver and brass out of the temple and took them to Babylon. Prior to that, another group had come along named the Assyrians. They did the same thing. They took, they conquered Israel and they hauled off all the people they could haul off. And that's where the um, uh, Samaritan idea came in, where they were mixed blood people with the Jewish with the Assyrians. And so that's what was the thing to do. So if you conquered a people, then you would take them in as hostage, what have you, make slaves, what have you, and that was the situation. Well, Cyrus is now king. Okay? He has conquered Debit, uh, Babylon, and he is king. Now, adversaries come along, if you go to Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6, verse 12 on there, he sent a decree because he was a very humane man. He did the very opposite things that Nebuchadnezzar did, and the very, very opposite things that Syrians did. Instead of pillaging and taking from, he sends them back home. See, the Jewish people went in bondage in, Egypt, in, in uh, Babylon. They sat on the banks of the Euphrates, and the Babylonians said, Sing to us your songs. And they said, We can't sing. Our harps are hanging on the willow trees. Our hearts are hurting. There's no song in our hearts. That was the condition in Babylon. So now, God raises up Cyrus, a person a, a in power, okay? And he is a man of compassion. 
He, he is a humane person. <clears throat> he is a person that loves people. I tease sometimes kids. I say, you're the kid that walk out of a cornfield and just enjoy plucking up corn by its roots and throwing it in the ditch. And so forth and so on. This man was humane. So now we find he has made a decree here in chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he might make a proclamation that the Jewish people get to go back to Jerusalem and build their, rebuild their temple. There are oppositions, adversaries, people try. Anytime God is doing a work, Satan is always working his best to stop it. People write nasty letters. You ever have any, how many people here are pastors? Okay, I'm not the only one. People do that. They'll write you nasty letters and they'll tell you that, and say all kinds of things. Well, that's what happened there. Made accusations, they're trying to stop it. But God is working and makes a decree. And if you go to chapter 5, Ezra chapter 5, Ezra chapter 5, Ezra chapter 5. Go with me there in chapter 5, and you'll find there in chapter 5, verse number 13. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, but in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the same king Cyrus, made a decree to build the house of God. A decree. Verse 14. And the vessels of also of gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had, had taken away, are being restored. And so Cyrus has made a decree. All this is to be restored. And so now they're going back to Jerusalem because God said 200 years before this man was even born, he was going to raise up a righteous man to send his people back. God has a way of raising up, lifting up, okay? Well, what happened after Cyrus? Well, Cyrus had a daughter. And guess what? Darius married his daughter. And you'll find more about Darius in the book of Daniel and the situation with Daniel being thrown the lion's den and how Darius was so hurt and broken that this happened. And so Darius wants to keep his mother-in-law happy. Do you understand that? Always keep your mother-in-law happy. And my mother-in-law came to see us right after our oldest daughter, Kim, was born. If you've heard the story, you can enjoy it again. If you haven't heard it, then listen carefully. And I'm standing at, over the crib the day we bring Jim and my wife from the hospital, and my mother-in-law is there, and I'm sitting there looking about a little precious, can't believe it, this is my child. Man, this is something, and we just ooing and ooing and you know, I, my children are always the best in the world. And so I'm just making a big ado. And, and I said, just think, someday, some sorrow, good for nothing, low down rascals, just go, come and take a puppet. My mother in law said, that's exactly what happened to my dog. <laughs> <laughs> I told that when Kim was getting married to Bob Jones, she got married in the memorial building there, and all of the Jones people there, and all of the people there. And Joel Squire sang at a wedding, all that. So, it all, so I told that story there then. And later I was up there for chapel speaking, and this guy said, You look familiar. Your voice, are you the one that dared to tell a story about your little girl? And da da da. That was me. Well, Darius wants to keep his fellow law happy. So he's going to confirm to everything that. God led upon Cyrus to do. So what God wants Cyrus to do, Darius, same thing. You see how God's working? How God puts people together? How God works together with people? And then, and Texas, he too sends Elijah when he became king. We find in chapter 7, he sends Elijah to Judah with special, special privileges. And so off he goes with special privileges. And so the restoring, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. God raised up his word. He does it every day. If you will be a day-by-day -day faithful student in God's word, the Bible, you've heard this before, haven't you? The Bible is the schoolhouse. The Holy Spirit 
is your teacher. Your teacher. Remember that. The Word of God, the schoolhouse, the Bible, your teacher. And so we find God has a plan. So thirdly, God raises up his plan. The Bible, people, three, three kings, and now people, the church. If you go with me to the uh, book of Matthew, you find in Matthew chapter 16, the Lord is talking there to Peter. There at Caesarea Philippi, there we up there, way up above at the headwaters of the the Jordan, and he asked the disciples, Whom say ye that I am? And so forth and so on. So that's the conversation. And we find that Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe personally that Jesus looked at Peter right down and said, Peter, who do you think I am? Just read it. Who is this man standing in front of you? And for the first time, a resounding, thundering in the, on the horizon, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says this, as he talks to him, um, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this, this rock. And the rock he's talking about is that doctrinal statement. Not the man, Peter, but the person Christ. Christ, the Son of God. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about here the birth of the church. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto you, listen to you, but my Father which is in heaven. The church is not of the flesh and blood. This church was not founded by Barry Owen. Okay? I am not the founder. Notice what it says. In, uh, as you go on over to um, chapter 18, verse 19. There was a time in my life when I had come to a calm. A period means the undertaker is coming to get you. A comma means everything's going to change to some degree. Like the night I asked my wife, do you think you would ever consider up marrying me? I was always, I couldn't handle rejection. If I ever asked a girl on the phone for a date, she said no, but that was it. She, as far as I'm concerned, I'd just been tossed under the bus. And I knew I wanted to marry her, and I wanted to make sure that I gave her, gave myself a way out of the situation, so I didn't say, would you marry me? I said, do you think you might would ever, ever, ever consider it? And she said yes, and from that moment on, my life was changed. Okay. I mean, in a wonderful way. Well, sometimes in life you come to where there's a calm. So I'd come to a calm in my life, and I was praying as I was looking for a church to pastor. And there was a window of time, and this particular church was looking for a preacher. And so I was praying that church would call me. It was a church called Philadelphia Summit the Church in Mars, South Carolina. Well, Mars County. And uh, the, one of the men there was the evangelist that was preaching the night I got saved some years before that. Well, now, and so my prayer was, Lord, if that church calls me, I think that's the way I know you want me to go. So there was about a month of time in there when they were supposed to call, they didn't call, and they didn't call. And I checked to make sure my phone was working. I went somewhere to call my phone, make sure my phone was working. Nothing was happening. Nothing was happening. Nothing was happening. And I was waking up every morning about 4 o'clock. As God would have it, I woke up one morning around 4 o'clock and I'm reading my Bible and I come to Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. If two will join hands and ask of a thing, our Father in heaven will do it. I saw you heard the story, but it wouldn't hurt you to hear it again. God spoke to me by the power of the Spirit that moment. My wife came down for breakfast. I stopped her in the den. We had an upstairs bedroom, and when I, came, when I woke up, I came on downstairs. 
And I said, let me sit here and read this to you. So I read to her Matthew 18, 19. If two will join hands and ask of us a thing, our Father in heaven will do it. I said, the Lord wants us to start a Bible church. God. Bible based church. Word of God. What should we ask for? She said, let's ask the Lord to give us a place to live. That's a pretty good challenge, isn't it? And let's ask the Lord to give you a job working three days a week. As I remember it, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <coughs> About 15 minutes after that, as she was in the kitchen cooking breakfast at 7.30 a.m., the doorbell rings. And I go to the door and a man named Owen Bailey that I only knew him of him. He only knew I was a preacher and that was it. He drove six and a half blocks looking for it to be drove by, I'm sure, other preachers to come to my house and he knocked on my door and I said, Owen, oh, what do you want? What, what do you do my house for? Quickly we sat at it. My wife and I caught and decided we we'll move to Bottle Beach for, big, for our retirement. We want you to help us find a Christian family to move into our house. Owen, I'll call you tomorrow. But don't do anything until I do. He left. My wife said, what are you waiting on? I said, we asked for two things. Next morning, I met a lady in the leather league on who knew of us, and that was it. Called and wanted to speak to my wife. She said, Miss Jerry, you know, I'm a third owner in this Pandora's box dress store where people come in and buy pompous on there. It's a relaxing atmosphere. You just sit there, enjoy a condition until, until your appointments come. And so, would you come and work for me but I can only give you Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Amen. What do you do? What do you do? I learned what happened when you rebelled. I found that out in the Atlantic Ocean that night with that guy that I was trying to sober up. The wave knocked me down and knocked him down and I looked up, he was gone. And I knew why I was there because I was in the mind of, I don't want to be a preacher, I don't want to be a preacher, no, not me, I don't want to be a preacher, I want to be a farmer, I want to live on the farm. I don't want to, me, a preacher, no. God got my attention. And so the Lord founded Friend Bible Church. Amen. Alright. We met. I went up to the wilds and spent the whole week praying with Tom Farrell and some others. We <coughs> went down and said, when you get to Rich Charleston, call the Seventh day Adventist State and Rich are building on Sunday because they'll be on Saturday. When I got home, a man who had met and talk with me about this, call me up. He said, guess what? We have rented a Seventh-day Adventist building. We'll have church there Sunday. I knew then God was in it. <coughs> he was in me. Well, we had two widows in our church. Miss Myrtle Merle. Miss Myrtle Merle and her husband, wonderful couple with no children, every year spent three, four weeks in the mountains. They loved camping out in the mountains when the leaves would turn. Finally came time for retirement, and they planned a long trip for several months to go all the way to the Atlantic Coast, the Pacific Ocean, Grand Canyon, Yellowstone. Halfway back at a campground, she woke up in the middle of the night to find her husband dead. A widow. So she and another widow that were connected through marriage were living together, Miss Merle and Miss Cofield. We weren't meeting for about a month, and Miss Merle says, We're going to move to Orangeburg, the <coughs> Methodist home up there. And I said to myself, We're packing in about 20, 10 or 12 kids. Boy, this is going the right direction, isn't it? Well, when she sold her house, she gave the very first contribution to our building fund. She sold her house for $50,000, and she gave our church $50,000. She gave the church $5,000 for our building fund. And that was the birth of what we now have. Okay. They move up there, and the day they moved in, a man named Floyd Arat moves in next door, who was a retired school principal for North Charleston High. Long story short, he was hurting. He was young Methodist, and he was not happy because they were no longer teaching that the Bible that there was a hell. And he realized where the situation was going, and he asked me to come and. Read the Bible. So every time I'd go up there, I'd go and read the Bible to him. And God laid on his heart, and he left our church the money that basically bought this property. And so I'm here to tell you, this is God working. Okay? This is not about me. This is, this, you are surrounded by, and I can hear you talk for hour on end. 
of all the things the Lord has done. So I, we just announced prime time, didn't we? Did Miss Myrtle Morrow said, let's organize a group for the elder and call it prime timers. That was Miss Pearl Merle. And Miss Caulfield, the two together, when I went to help them move and load their furniture, I met a man named Don Lair. He had never, he, he was not a church going person, but he went home and told his wife that he liked me. I don't know how that happened, but he still, that's why he told him. They started coming to church, he got saved, he got saved three times. <laughs> He got saved, and later he said, he came back all the time, and he said, I just thought, that it's too simple, I, 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 don't, I don't really, I don't, I don't, I went through the plan of salvation, okay, and so I did, about six months later, he came again, I said, Don, we're saved by grace, not by works, he built this pulpit, and it's heavy, he himself built this pulpit, so I'm here to tell you, God has a way of raising up, God has a way of doing things. God is the one, not man. Okay? <clears throat> when I was 14 years old, except for my Savior, and my dad's older sister said, I'll send you to youth camp if you'll go. $15 was $15. And I went to youth camp, and that's when God called me to ministry. Was that what I was saying? And so the point I'm trying to tell you is this. Everything you do in sharing the gospel, everything you do in being here today, putting your tithes and offering the question plate, going out of visitation, everything, you're a part of God raising up a ministry. And this church, I've been pastoring now 62 years, and I've been pastoring in Charleston 80, since 1980, and this church is unique like no other church. It is unique. It is self-indigenous. It's never, it was not built by other people, by, by other denominational people. It was not another movement. It was God did it, God said it, God did it, and here it is. Amen. And so I encourage you to uh, realize and appreciate what you are surrounded by here is the handiwork of God. Amen. Not of man. Amen. Right. Just like God raised up three kings to help Israel be restored back to Jerusalem, God has raised up. God will do great things, okay? But he does great things primarily through small people. And that's God. He does great things through small people. People like myself. I'm just a little country boy from Ridgeville. Grew up on a farm. Okay? I, I never did speak English properly, and I still don't. I guess you noticed that by now. But God uses people. And God wants to use us to stand true and stay firm as we go through what's happening in our culture today. Amen. Don't budge off of this book. Stay with the Word of God. For the Word of God is true without error. Okay? It is without error. A man named John... Whitecliffe is how some pronounce it. Whitcliffe is how some pronounce it. Born in 1324. He was the morning star of the Reformation. The, the morning star. His work laid the groundwork for the Reformation. This was when people were not allowed to have the Word of God. He felt called of God to translate the Bible into English. When people had were caught with scripture, the scripture would sometimes would be tied around their neck and set fire and they would be burnt alive. This is what was going on. They were, they were teaching uh, transubstantiation, meaning uh, the communion turns into the real body and blood of Christ. And if you don't take the communion to minister to you by our priest, then you're not going to. Have. This was controlling the people. And so he translated the Bible to English, came under a lot of persecution. He finally died and was buried. But his burial was a torment to those who were in a position of power trying to control people's lives, denying them the word of God so they can control what they believe and who they believe, and etc. And so the powers of me dug his body up, burnt his bones to ashes, 
through the Thames River in England. And it gently flowed between his banks out into the ocean and found its way to the shores of America. And we find ourselves the birth of a Christian nation, America. That's the power of God's word. Yeah. That's the power of God and his handiwork. And so we're here today to serve the Lord, acknowledge his doings, give him all the praise and honor. When Jesus resurrected that young man in name, the people said, Ah, oh, God has visited us. When I walk on this property, I know God has visited us. This is God's doings, not man's. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask your blessing now as we uh, conclude our service that the Spirit of God might work in our hearts and lives. They're in here, Lord, that do not know Christ as their Savior. We give the invitation unto salvation. Others might want to rededicate themselves. We pray for them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.